since I'm looking into the light, I'm hoping I'm missing some people in the audience, but uh, I don't think on Saturday morning opposite another panel with telecom uh, implications, I don't think we could have expected uh, to fill the room. Uh, however, we do have a very timely topic, and one with some expert panelists. I'll give you just a brief, oh by the way, I'm Dave Centrell, just a brief uh, overview of the format, and then we will start into it. I'm told to announce that we're going to begin with opening remarks by Robert McDowell, Commissioner McDowell. That will be followed by a keynote address by Congressman, former Congressman Tom Talkie. Now, I do not know why the first one is opening remarks and the second one is a keynote address. <laughs> I think it's probably because you have to be a member of Congress to give a keynote address, and you, you can be a commissioner and give opening remarks. <laughs> that said, then, we will hear then from the panelists with remarks inspired by, responsive to the remarks of the two who are opening. There's no way that I can limit the subject, so if they want to talk about something else, they'll do that. <laughs> To let you know who you're hearing from first, and I will pop up and tell you about Congressman Talkie at the end of this, and then I'll tell you about all the panelists at once. But Robert McDowell was appointed to his seat on the Federal Communications Commission by President George W. Bush, confirmed by the Senate in 2006. He was reappointed in 2009. He became the first Republican to be appointed to an independent agency by President Barack Obama. During his time on the Commission, he's worked to help consumers and communications marketplace enjoy the benefit of more choices, lower prices, and useful innovations through increased competition. Commissioner McDowell has had 16 years of experience in the private sector communications industry before coming to the Commission. Immediately before joining the FCC, he was Senior Vice President for the Competitive Telecom Association an association representing competitive facilities-based telecom services providers and their suppliers. There he had responsibility involving advocacy efforts before Congress, the White House, and the agencies. He served on the North American Numbering Council. Before Comtel, he served as Executive Vice President and General Counsel of America's Carriers Telecom Association, ACTA, which became part of Comtel. He graduated cum laude from Duke University which means he had the good fortune to be close to the University of North Carolina. <laughs> then served as, chief, as legislative aide, then finished law school at uh, William and Mary, joined the Washington firm of Harder, Arter and Hatton, Washington office of Arter and Hatton, and from there you know the rest of the story in the telecom. So we'll hear next from Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and I forgot about the Duke-UNC uh, rivalry thing we might have today. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> UNC looks good this year, though. They look good. You didn't see them last night. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. You're, you're in it. That oh, state is no longer operative. Very good. Well, we'll just skip right over that. Duke looks good this year, though. Well, so far, we're not going to They're cursed because they're preseason number one, and that's always a curse for Duke. It's usually good for North Carolina. But thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> and, Somehow I feel compelled to start my remarks with the following words. Uh, may it please the court. Um, and usually when Judge Sintel meets an FCC employee, that's how the conversation begins. Um, but uh, in any case, in all uh, seriousness, it's terrific to uh, return to the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. I think this is the third, maybe even the fourth, third time I've been here uh, since I've been a commissioner. So thanks for um, having me here. And I'm looking forward to listening to what promises to be a lively discussion with uh, our uh, experts here on uh, communications law over whether Congress should rewrite the statute uh, that projects government's reach into about one-sixth of our economy by some estimates. And of course only lawyers uh, could look forward to discussing the finer details of such topics uh, on what is otherwise a lovely Saturday morning. Um, so uh, thank you for, uh, for coming and being a lawyer myself, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So while preparing my remarks, I, was, uh, I reviewed my speech from last year, and boy was it long. Um, you know that any speech that contains 21 footnotes is going to be a real stem winder, and uh, so uh, I must have been thinking I was going to get extra CLD credit or something for that. But I promise you that uh, 
uh, this one will be a, a lot shorter. Um, but as I read through last year's speech, I realized that I could give pretty much the same speech today, and, and don't worry, I won't, but uh, at least I'm not going to give all of it. But in some ways, the debate over whether the FCC should regulate internet network management hasn't changed much in the, in the past 365 days. On the other hand, I've heard a lot of chatter from the communications bar, uh, Wall Street analysts, reporters, uh, just in the past 72 hours. And this morning, speculation abounds. And let me just say at the outset, that as a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, appointed by two presidents and unanimously confirmed by the Senate twice, that I have absolutely no idea what the FCC is going to do when it comes to net neutrality, <laughs> uh, when or even if. So I'm going to talk about this morning what I do know. One question, however, regarding the Commission's authority to regulate internet network management under Title I has been answered, and correctly, in my view, uh, by the DC Circuit in its decision in the Comcast v. FCC case. And just to refresh memories, or for those in the audience who may not know, I dissented from the Commission's 2008 Comcast order because, for starters, uh, I did not think that the FCC had the power to act as it did. And in April, a unanimous panel of the D.C. Circuit uh, thought likewise when it held that the Commission failed to show what under underlying statutory mandate provided the legal foundation needed to claim Title I ancillary authority to regulate this part of the Internet. The court did not go so far as to say that the Commission had absolutely no authority to act. It merely determined that the FCC failed to make its case. The court reminded the Commission that ancillary authority had to be related to some mission explicitly authorized by Congress. When it comes to regulating Internet network management, however, Congress has passed no such law. That last part was my part, not the court. After repeated and exhaustive reviews of the statute and the record, I still can't find anything close to a congressional mandate for the FCC to regulate information services, as some have proposed for years. Although Congress has not passed legislation on the matter, it has not been silent either. In the past year, a large bipartisan majority of Congress, now when's the last time you heard those words strung together? A large bipartisan majority of Congress warned the Commission against trying to issue net neutrality rules. More than 300 members of Congress, including 86 Democrats, have demanded that the Commission abandon its proposed course and leave this issue for Congress to decide. And it is my sense that the volume behind this message will only increase. Just a hunch. Some are guessing that the FCC could try to adopt rules that look something like the legislation recently drafted by the current House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman, Henry Waxman. In addition to barring a classification of internet access services under Title II, the old telephone laws uh, from the 1934 Act, the Waxman draft bill contained a sunset provision that would end new Title I regulation of network management after two years. In short, the bill was designed to be temporary or interim. Those who may think that the Commission will escape another appellate rebuke merely by labeling a new Title I order as interim should reevaluate their strategy. Although courts generally have been def deferential to an agency when it issues an interim order, it helps an agency's case tremendously if it can point to some facts to justify such extraordinary action, such as an emergency, a real emergency. In the case of regulating internet network <coughs> management, where is the evidence of an emergency? Should administrative agencies be allowed to regulate far beyond the bounds authorized by Congress merely by labeling an order as interim? If so, wouldn't agencies' legal powers essentially be unlimited? Wouldn't Congress become irrelevant in such a scenario? Appropriately, this morning's panel is intended to focus on what Congress should do when it comes to updating America's communications policy. But before I go further, please keep in mind that I subscribe to the philosophy that I, as a commissioner, shouldn't tell Congress what to do, Congress tells me what to do. But whether policy changes affecting broadband internet access services emanate from the FCC or Congress, a plethora of important threshold questions abound. And I hope that legislators would ask all of them 
and then some. Among them, and I have asked some of these before, but I always like to begin with the first threshold question. Is the broadband internet access market broken? If so, can only the government fix it? In other words, where is the evidence illustrating that today's deregulatory model, the same model that has been in existence since the internet was privatized in 1994, has failed? Hasn't today's model, today's model, produced the open and freedom-enhancing internet that has thrived so amazingly precisely because governments have kept their hands off of it? Isn't it the greatest deregulatory success story of all time? How has the factual landscape changed since just this past January when the Department of Justice examined this market and concluded that no evidence of a concentration or abuse of market power existed that would warrant regulation? What has changed? What would be the international implications of the U.S. expanding government intervention to this area by reversing hands-off policies, bipartisan hands-off policies that have existed since the Clinton-Gore administration? Would U.S. regulation spark an international chain reaction of internet regulation? How could the U.S. justify being more regulatory than the European Commission when its chief digital agenda policymaker just last week announced that she opposes new regulation of internet network management? Wouldn't some proposed rules cause irreparable harm to network operators by affecting their ability to raise crucial investment capital needed to modernize their networks, not to mention irreparably harming their ability to innovate? Isn't there a likelihood of success on the merits because of a, the lack of even implicit statutory authority? Most importantly, one can't speak at a Federal Society event without mentioning the very good ladder, ladder, ladder Brian. Ladder. Very good, thank you. <laughs> the Constitution, thank you. Of course, you were there last, last year's class where I asked the same question, so you had a little bit of fetch. In fact, as luck would have it, you know what happened 221 years ago today? The first state voted to ratify the Bill of Rights 221 years ago today, November 20th. And do you know what that state was? No, not Delaware. It was the first state admitted to the Union, but an unlikely, well, there were only 13 of them, but an unlikely uh, New Jersey. I didn't know that until I looked it up. So, so that was today. New Jersey became the first state to ratify the Bill of Rights. You from Jersey? Where are you from? Clifton. Clifton. Any other Jerseyites? I'm a Virginian, but you know, very good. Okay, well, congratulations. Who knew? <laughs> so. Who would have guessed, you know, that Jersey was the first to ratify the Bill of Rights? Anyway, so that fact provides a nice segue to one of the most important sets of questions lawmakers should ask, or FCC commissioners. Would brand new government regulation of privately funded communications networks survive constitutional muster, especially under the First and Fifth Amendments? And I want to emphasize this, though. There is a way to avoid all of these legal pitfalls and economic pitfalls. I hope that, the, that before the Commission takes a giant leap into a potentially dark and dangerous regulatory abyss, it would seriously consider an idea that I have suggested for several years now. For those fearful of anti-competitive conduct in the broadband market, in lieu, in lieu of new rules, the FCC could create a heightened role for itself. It could lead a coordinated effort with similarly inspired partners, such as already established non-governmental internet governance groups, the Federal Trade Commission, and other antitrust and consumer protection agencies, public interest and consumer groups, trade associations, academics, and many others. This new alliance could spotlight allegations of anti-competitive behavior and use already existing consumer protection and antitrust laws to punish bad actors and aid consumers. Coupled with a continued drive to create new opportunities for broadband competition, such an approach could help preserve the open and freedom-enhancing internet we enjoy under today's deregulatory model, all without the uncertainty, costs, and risks new rules always bring. And my door remains open for such a discussion. But back to today's panel. Hopefully most legislative efforts would involve issues 
unrelated to network management. Ideas I'm hopeful the panel will discuss include everything from reform of our bloated and inefficient universal service system, to updating the cumbersome Sunshine and Government Act, to voluntary incentive auctions to spur broadcast spectrum reallocation, to elimination of the 76-year-old statutory stovepipes that no longer bear any resemblance to the state of the marketplace. For example, like the vast majority of American consumers, my three children, ages 3 through 11, don't care which platform or technology delivers their video and audio content, be it wireless, broadcast, coaxial cable, copper wires, fiber, or satellite. To them, the delivery mechanism is meaningless. They just want the content when and where they choose. Shouldn't the law reflect these realities, realities that didn't exist just a few years ago? Regardless of whether legislators pursue narrow bills or comprehensive rewrites, we should all remember that James Madison's separation of powers construct was designed to make it difficult to turn legislation into law. These tasks may be even harder with today's newly divided government. Of course, when it comes to communications legislation, we should keep in mind that a newly minted Republican Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and a first-term Democratic president signed it into law almost 15 years ago. But that came about after an intensive bipartisan effort that stretched over 12 years, starting with the breakup of AT&T in 1984. When it comes to new legislation, sometimes the best watchwords are patience, persistence, and most importantly, prudence. One thing is for sure, the coming weeks and months will be fascinating for FCC watchers, so enjoy the show. <laughs> Um, and thank you for having me today, and I look forward to learning from this wonderful panel. Thank you, Your Honor. Next, we're going to have our keynote address. Congressman Talkie, former Congressman Talkie, is the Executive Vice President for Public Affairs, Policy, and Communications of, uh, is this in here somewhere? Verizon, excuse me. <laughs> they keep changing its name. You know. uh, as the company's senior policy executive, he's responsible for the development of Verizon's public policy positions and advocacy in the local, state, foreign, and international levels. He serves as a member of Verizon's <coughs> Leadership Council. He came to Verizon, and this is what I was kidding about, it could be with, through Ninex, a predecessor company of Verizon, in 1991. <coughs> Talkie was a member of Congress, representing Iowa's 2nd Congressional District from 1979 to 91. He was a member of the Telecom Subcommittee, as relevant to this case, along with some other committees. Served as a member of the Iowa General Assembly from 75 to 79. He's past chairman of U.S. Telecom Association, currently serves on the Board of Directors. He's Bachelor of Arts, is from Loris College. His degree in law is from Iowa College. Congressman Dawson. Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here this morning and have a chance to uh, listen to uh, my favorite uh, FCC commissioner, uh, but also to have uh, the opportunity to uh, share a few thoughts with uh, this distinguished uh, group. Um, I generally uh, do not uh, uh, read prepared remarks, uh, but this morning I am going to, uh, not because they're so profound, uh, but because I have great respect for this organization. It was a wise person who first said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The obvious corollary is, if it is broke, fix it. Today we'll discuss what ain't broke and what is. The internet ecosystem falls into the ain't broke category. It is working. It is a highly innovative sector of the economy that even in tough times, dumped tens of billions of investment a year into the economy and created hundreds of thousands of new jobs. It is changing the way we work, live, and play. Yet most of us don't necessarily understand it. When we talk about the internet ecosystem, it's not just the physical broadband and wireless networks built with the equipment of Cisco or Lucent or deployed by companies like Verizon or Comcast. 
It's not just websites like YouTube or Amazon or Drudge or Netflix. It's not just applications or operating system developers like Microsoft or Google or device manufacturers like Motorola or Apple or content creators like Disney or News Corp. It's all of them. The result of all of these players working together is a unique evolving marketplace that spurs economic growth and innovation at a rate the likes of which we have never seen. Some people call what is happening in the wireline and wireless broadband world cross-platform or modular competition. But a simpler way to think about it is a mix, mix and match marketplace. You have traditional companies or traditional competition among companies offering services or products that are similar in their focus. Verizon, for example, is competing against cable companies for video customers, against AT&T and IBM for large business or enterprise customers, and against Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, and others for wireless customers. But the internet marketplace is also increasingly marked by competition between and among companies that now operate in sectors of the communication space where previously they did not. Just as Verizon has entered the video marketplace, for example, we've see, com seen competition for our core voice service from companies like Skype and Google, cable and, of course, wireless. Just to complicate matters, we often find ourselves partnering with companies in one sphere against whom we compete in another. For example, Google, Motorola, and Verizon Wireless are pushing the droid to compete against the Apple AT&T iPhone. At the same time, Verizon and Apple are combining efforts on the iPad with Verizon's mobile Wi-Fi service. In other words, the terms of competition have fundamentally changed. Everyone is competing as hard as they can by collaborating with whomever they can to help them create new value propositions. As I sat at our board meeting this year, our board retreat this year, it really struck me. A few years ago when our board met, all of the discussion was about how you either buy it or build it, but the objective was to control it. This year at our board retreat, we had five other CEOs there from companies with, which, with whom we are partnering. Bottom line is, the world has changed. All of these companies have at their, are at the center of this ecosystem, and all of these companies and the efforts at competition are the consumers. They are the clear winners in this marketplace as they choose among an amazing array of new products and services. So if the broadband internet ecosystem ain't broke, what is? Answer, the public policy framework. When the communication statute was last overhauled, we had the telephone sector, the cable TV sector, and the wireless sector. The statute and the policy structure that was amended in 1996 still reflects that relatively simple siloed world. But that world has changed, and the antiquated policy framework no longer makes sense. The results of this outdated framework are the kinds of issues that we continue to slog through and which Commissioner McDowell discussed. You know the list. Net neutrality, Title I or Title II regulation of broadband, universal service reform, retransmission, and more. The grinding you hear are the gears churning as policymakers try to fit fast changing technologies and competitive markets into regulatory boxes built for analog technologies and monopoly markets. The resulting dissonance creates uncertainty for all players in the marketplace and, I might observe, some unhelpful approaches to a variety of issues. For example, in looking at the so-called net neutrality issue, the FCC has considered the possibility that internet traffic could be blocked or degraded, neg negatively affecting the consumer experience. I might observe we don't have evidence of that, but there's the possibility. The FCC's focus in this regard has been solely on the behavior of internet service providers. 
But the consumer's online experience can be similarly affected by those who develop the operating systems, the hardware, the web browsers, or the applications. The, com the, cons the companies controlling those aspects of the consumer experience are different from the ISPs, but the potential negative outcome for the consumer is the same. So why is it that the FCC doesn't consider the activities of those who control the operating systems or applications? I think it's because the FCC looks at the world from the standpoint of its jurisdiction rather than from the perspective of the consumer. Given the outdated statute, that's somewhat understandable. But from a reasonable person's perspective, that approach makes no sense. That is why we need Congress to update the law. In considering a new policy framework, I would offer the following suggestions. First, while we strongly believe that the communications market is dynamic, competitive, and functioning well, and that a well-functioning technology-based marketplace should be allowed to innovate and to evolve without government interference, we do recognize that there is a role for the government. As a good actor in the space, we see a need for rules of the road and a mechanism for dealing with bad actors. Second, given the nature of the internet, the rules we believe should be set at the federal level. One of the great innovations of our Constitution was the Commerce Clause, which put in place the federal framework for how states conduct trade and business. It essentially created an American common market. The internet system by ecosystem by any measure is national and global in scope and is not bound by state lines or borders. Just as over 220 years ago, the founders saw the folly in 13 different sets of rules for interstate commerce, it makes no sense today to have 50 different sets of rules for a network of global networks, the internet ecosystem. This is an area where a national policy is required. Third, the policy structure built for a monopoly telephone market that relies on the development of detailed rules that anticipate problems and try to prevent those problems just doesn't work in this fast-paced competitive world. Instead, the statute should contain overarching principles enforced on a case-by-case -case basis. This approach will allow policymakers to begin addressing real issues of harm to the consumer or the marketplace while establishing case law and legal handrails around issues as they arise. Fourth, the new statute should establish clear jurisdiction in this space for a single federal agency. And it should establish clear parameters for what that agency should and should not do in the space so that all players in the ecosystem are operating under the same rules. Finally, the test for government intervention in the marketplace should be to prevent harm to consumers and anti-competitive activity. In addition to establishing a new statutory framework to handle competition and consumer issues in the broadband internet space, Congress should also focus on some other pressing matters specifically cybersecurity, consumer privacy, and antiquated communication subsidy programs. When the internet got started several decades ago, very few of the internet pioneers envisioned a future where their experiment would become a global phenomenon and a primary engine for economic prosperity. Now, decades later, the internet's core protocols are largely unchanged and they are vulnerable. Criminal elements are able to leverage the internet's inherent weaknesses and certain governments around the world and terrorists see it as a future war fighting domain and a place for espionage and subversion. There are no easy answers here and much work is already going on within industry and government to address, address the cybersecurity issue. But if we want to ensure the health of these vital networks and the safety of our society, it's important that industry and policymakers work together in a coordinated effort to ensure a secure internet infrastructure and the framework for doing that needs to be addressed by the Congress. 
We also need to ensure that consumers feel safe and secure as more and more of their personal lives are conducted online. Broadband is enabling such area, great opportunities in such areas as banking and healthcare monitoring, home security, and education. We want consumers to feel comfortable using more of this empowering technology. And that will only happen if they feel confident that their private information is secure and protected. A new privacy policy should ensure that consumers are informed and given the opportunity to consent before information about them is gathered. And again, it should apply to all players in the space. The policy should also ensure that companies provide useful information about what types of information they gather, how it is collected, and for what purpose. Finally, the other issue we must address is the notion of universal service for rural and low-income consumers. We believe that a policy that facilitates the connection of all Americans to these data networks is appropriate and is in the national interest. Yet it appears that the forces of technology and the marketplace, amazing as they are, may not solve the economic challenge of supporting the necessary communications infrastructure in some of the more remote areas of the country. Some kind of support or subsidy, therefore, may be appropriate. But the current system of hidden subsidies contained in the intercarrier compensation system isn't working. It's gradually collapsing under pressure from changes in technology and the market. We need to rethink our approach to supporting a communications infrastructure in rural America. In addressing the needs of lower income households to access communications networks, we should look at the model for other consumer assisted programs such as food stamps. Now I know that's not everybody's favorite program here, but that system works because the consumer receives direct support from the government and then makes choices in the marketplace. While it may not be your favorite program, let me submit this thought. If instead of food stamps, the agriculture department sent the dollars directly to the grocery stores and then wrote rules telling the grocery stores how to distribute food to ensure the needs of low-income residents were met, I don't think we'd have the efficient food distribution system we have today. Yet in our industry, the dollars go to the providers, and then the FCC writes rules, and that approach simply doesn't work in a competitive marketplace. In the new world of communications, any subsidy should be targeted to consumers, not corporate intermediaries. As we discuss a new telecom statute, as well as how best to address other challenges relating to the internet space, it's important to remember our arching, overarching goal. We want a competitive, consumer-focused internet ecosystem that encourages investment and innovation. The power of broadband to stimulate economic growth, create new jobs, and expand opportunities for all of our citizens comes directly from the dynamic, churning, innovative stew we see in the internet marketplace. This amazing ecosystem is not only an economic engine for our nation, it also holds great promise for improving the delivery of health care, revolutionizing our approach to education, and improving our transportation systems and electric grids. It is a platform that will deliver on the American dream and give our children a quality of life better than our own. That is why we cannot allow regulators to impose limits or outmoded regulatory structures on this dynamic ecosystem. That is why we do need Congress to replace the current statute with one that is in sync with today's communications technology and marketplace. Thank you very much. At the panel will now be given a few minutes apiece to respond. They have chosen their order of response. I'm going to introduce all four of them before they begin, and then we won't be interrupting their flow. Uh, I didn't choose this order, so I don't know how they decided who's first and last. Howard W. Waltzman is the former Chief Telecom Counsel of the U.S. House for Energy and Commerce Committee, a partner at Mayor Brown. 
Washington, D.C. He focuses his practice on communications and internet law and commercial transactions. He was a drafter and expert on the communications legislation around the Telecom Acts of 1996. Before joining the Energy and Commerce Committee, he served as General Counsel to U.S. Senator Sam Brownback. He graduated from Wesley University and has his law degree from George Washington University here in D.C. Next is Sean Chang, who is currently the Telecommunications Counsel for the Committee of Energy on Energy and Commerce of the U.S. House of Representatives, is chaired by Congressman Waxman. Prior to that position, he served as Deputy Policy Advisor of Free Press. He also uh, served as Legislative Assistant to Representative Tommy, excuse me, Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. Diane Watson of California and Patsy Mink of Hawaii. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and George Washington University Law School. Maureen K. Olhausen is a partner at the law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and Nauer. Heads up the FTC practice there. She spent 12 years at the FTC, uh, culminating in her service from 2004 to 2008 as Director of Policy Planning. Uh, prior to that, she had worked for uh, some judge named <laughs> Sintel or Sintelli or some <laughs> French or Italian guy, anyway. And she is a graduate of the University of Virginia and of George Mason University Law School, where she now teaches classes on privacy law and unfair trade practices. And finally, Parole Desai is Communications Policy Council for Consumers Union, the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports. She works out of the Washington, D.C. office, manages the organization's advocacy efforts on cable, wireless, telephone, and internet policy. Uh, she, prior to that, she served as vice president for Media Access Project, a nonprofit public interest law firm. Prior to MAP, she served as in-house counsel to MicroStrategy, Inc., McLean, Virginia. She was an associate in the telecom media Technology and Litigation Groups of the Law, Crowell and Morning. She's a graduate of New York Law School, where she participated in the Media Center. And her undergraduate degree is Rutgers in the first state to uh, adopt <laughs> <laughs> I would guess Virginia. We yield to New Jersey. Okay, let's begin. Well, we were going to flip a coin to decide who went first, but we didn't have a four-sided coin, so they decided to let the guy whose name is at the end of the alphabet, who for years always ends up going last, <laughs> going first. So uh, thank you to the Federal Society for the opportunity uh, to let me speak here today. I uh, appreciate the remarks of Commissioner Dow and uh, Tom Talkey uh, before me. Uh, I want to pick up on a couple points that, that Tom made that I think sets a stage for the tension between whether the Communications Act will be rewritten and when. On the one hand, as Tom men mentioned, the market's not broken. This entire debate about network neutrality and broadband reclassification has been about a theoretical potential threat to Internet openness in the future. It has not been about some you know, pervasive, demonstrable harm and, and blocking and degrading that, that's occurring in the, the market every day. So on the one hand, usually Congress reacts, and often, as uh, Tom knows from his days on the Hill, overreacts when there's a sort of distinctive problem that, um, that causes uh, Congress to sort of act with haste. That, that doesn't exist in the uh, communications market, in particular in the broadband market today. On the other hand, the act itself is broken. What we basically have is a regulatory framework, largely from 1934, though in reality it's not from 1934, it's from the 1880s because it's based on the, um, the, stat the, the framework set up for uh, railroads um, in the Interstate Commerce Act. And even if you look at the definitions that the FCC has been struggling with, with respect to if and how to regulate broadband services, you have definitions which have been in statute, as Rob mentioned, for almost 15 years since the 96 Act passed, but in reality are based on the um, now almost 30-year-old basic and enhanced um, definitions that the FCC has used. So we're trying to take 
what is you know really a new and constantly evolving service and cram it into a statute that's over a hundred years, a regulatory framework that's over a hundred years old, and even trying to cr cram it into regulatory definitions to determine in what part of the statute it should be regulated, um, that's, you know, approximately 30 years old. Um, that doesn't work, and, and what that's created is, is the, the type of problems that, that we've seen. Um, you know, I, I personally think that the Kennard Commission got it right in the Stevens Report um, when it determined that broadband services were uh, properly classified as information services. Um, but the struggle we've had the last couple years has been whether or not that was correct. Obviously, the Supreme Court gave deference to the FCC's view on that, um, but the existing FCC uh, seems to want to go a different direction. And wh what that's caused is not just regulatory uncertainty, but market uncertainty. And you know, th that means that rather than have uh, investment dollars just you know, free for deployment, further deployment, enhancing networks, um, there's a lot of capital that's sort of been frozen because investors are discounting whether or not the FCC is going to regulate broadband services under Title II, and, you know, even more recently, is the FCC going to regulate broadband services and impose sort of a, a wholesome net neutrality regime um, under Title I? And, you know, that sort of uncertainty and, and confusion, um, you know, I believe is, is keeping capital on the sidelines, and that's capital that could and should be used to what is everybody's goal, which is ubiquitous broadband deployment and to have the fastest, most sophisticated broadband networks in the world. And while I think there's still a lot of debate about what a new regime needs to say, I mean, do, do you need a new statutory framework that, that sort of micromanages network management? I, I think there's a real question about whether or not that's the case. Um, there does need to be clarity from Congress about what the FCC can, and arguably more importantly, can't do in this space. And I, I think until that occurs, we're going to continue to have the type of wrenching uncertainty that we face right now. Hello, everyone. First of all, you guys should try to be on the panel over here because the lights are extremely bright. <laughs> so if I'm actually looking at the audience and squinting a little bit, um, I apologize. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think um, my reaction to, first of all, thank you for having me here on the panel and, uh, and, and uh, such honor to hear from Commissioner and, and Tom this morning. Um, I think I, I find much to agree with um, Howard on specifically the issue of uncertainty and normally uh, it is the time when there are so much uncertainty in the market that Congress steps in, uh, oftentimes at the petition of the industry to provide the rule of the road uh, that would allow investment to flow and, uh, and the innovation to occur. Um, I, I do think um, having just gone through the exercise of trying to uh, draft the interim uh, legislation known as the Waxman net neutrality legislation, um, I think there are certain um, elements that must be in place in order for a rewrite to occur. And I, I'm just personally skeptical that those elements are, are currently in place uh, for such a uh, undertaking to take place. Um, I think uncertainty is certainly what has been uh, for the past couple of years and certainly since uh, the DC Circuit's uh, Comcast decision. And that's why I think uh, there are uh, many players uh, in the industry, in the public interest community, in the high tech community who are willing to come to the table to really come craft a, a solution within a very short period of time as we were uh, assembling uh, the Waxman legislation and um, and I so uh, so that sort of market uncertainty has to uh, be in place and the second element is uh, people are just really tired 
uh, people were just really tired of addressing net neutrality over and over again. Keep talking about net neutrality. We've been talking about it since uh, 2005, and uh, people were ready to move on. There are a lot of other things in which there are a lot of consensus, um, and people were willing to really focus on how do we unleash uh, more spectrum so we can improve our competitive global competitiveness when it comes down to wireless services and technology. Uh, I, I think people uh, uh, are coalescing around a set of privacy principles uh, that I believe um, will be very important in the near term and um, and also uh, reforming the Universal Service Fund system. So so people were tired and they want to put this behind them and uh, and certainly that also urged all parties to come to the table and um, so when we look to next Congress, uh, one question that must be asked is, do we have some of these elements that are still going to be in play? Are there still going to be uncertainty? Are there still going to be players that's ready and willing to play ball and really sort of uh, come to a compromise position so we can move beyond uh, some of these issues and and uh, come to a set of uh, resolution uh, legislatively. And um, uh, looking back to what Howard sort of spearheaded a couple of years ago in terms of the last time we really tried to uh, uh, rewrite the Telecom Act, you know, we had a, a push for uh, on, on state franchising or national franchise for competitive video services. And back in 96, we had uh, local bell companies trying to get into the long distance market. So um, I, I, I just don't know if we have those certain um, uh, push uh, for all parties to come together again and make it happen in the near term. So. Thank you. Well, um, you know, one of the things that um, um, I, uh, in my past at the FTC, did was I headed up the FTC's Internet Access Task Force. And we looked at issues involving net neutrality. And while I don't want to focus solely on net neutrality, I do think it's a good lens to look at the issue of moving away from the Communications Act and the um, legacy legislation uh, in the area of communications, which was really reacting to a monopoly situation. To have a pervasive monopoly, how should that monopoly be regulated? The communications market has really moved very far to look a lot more like other markets, which I think is really a very, very good thing. And so then you uh, would sort of say, well, how are other markets regulated? How do um, competition, consumer protection issues get treated in other markets. And I think, um, you know, the antitrust approach, the consumer protection approach that's embodied in the Federal Trade Commission Act could provide a very good model for uh, a new communications uh, regulation. So um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that um, uh, the way the FTC looked at, or the FTC staff looked at the net neutrality issue was to say, okay, you know, what, what's going on? What are the harms? What's the best outcome come for consumers? And really looked at sort of the, um, the evidence of what harm is occurring in the market right now. And sort of came up with the idea that, well, on balance, could bad things happen? Yes. But could good things happen? Yes. So what should you do? You should wait and see if there's a problem. Also, is there a consumer protection issue, transparency about um, how traffic is managed? Is that another method in which to police the market? Uh, and the answer, again, was yes. And I do think it's interesting. Um, Commissioner McDowell mentioned that the EU uh, commissioner uh, who looked at this, looked at net neutrality, said, you know, I don't really see why we need to have this. And that's Nellie Cruz, who used to be head of the, uh, the competition authority in the EU, DigiComp. And I think providing sort of the, the, um, the expertise that antitrust offers about how markets operate can be very useful here. So I would suggest kind of looking to um, the antitrust, the consumer protection model uh, for legislation going forward. And one example that was put forth a number of years ago is the Digital um, Age Communications Act, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. And it recommended an unfair practices uh, approach that looked at a consumer welfare standard. And that's really important too, not just, you know, uh, antitrust law is very firm in saying that uh, the outcome should be what's best for consumers, not best, not 
not best for what, not what's best for other competitors. And so I think that's really important to have in there. And also to, uh, um, to look at the particulars of the communications market. Yes, it's a highly networked market. A lot of other markets are as well. Uh, not all of them are pervasively regulated. But um, DACA suggested that there should be um, limited in interconnection requirements, but not in every case, but only where sustained and um, substantial harm to consumer welfare would result otherwise. Um, and so I think, you know, the antitrust model sort of filtered through DACA might be an interesting uh, path to explore going forward and what should a new paradigm be for communications regulation. Thank you. I also want to thank the Federalist Society for having me here this morning. Such esteemed panelists, I'm very um, feel very privileged to be here this morning. Um, you know, I don't disagree with most folks on the panel. I think if Congress has the stomach to rewrite telecom legislation, I think they should go ahead and do it, and I'd be happy to participate. Um, I was still in uh, Rutgers University when the last act happened, so didn't wasn't able to participate then, but would love the opportunity to do so <laughs> in the future. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I think the FCC still has the jurisdiction and the authority and the ability to ensure that there are fair rules of the road. I think the Comcast case has created uncertainty, especially in the internet market, and I think the FCC still has the ability to read the statute, to interpret the statute, so that it can create fair rules of the road for all stakeholders, including ISPs, edge companies, consumers who want to be innovators. And so I do think there's a role for the FCC to act in parallel with any effort that Congress may undertake. And I think um, I think this an example of this was exemplified earlier this year when um, the FCC was deciding how to interpret its program access rules and whether the rules as they were written in 1992 could be applied to new delivery technologies. Back in 1992, most of um, the programming was delivered through satellite. There were rules that ensured that competitors could buy the programming of their competitors. Um, however, recent technology allowed uh, cable operators to deliver their programming through a different technology through terrestrial means. Uh, we, with Verizon and other companies, asked the FCC to read the statute and interpret the statute in a way that would allow Verizon and other companies to buy programming from their competitors. And eventually the FCC was able to and did interpret the statute over Commissioner McDowell's dissent, who did suggest that Congress should act, but we felt that it, you know, if Congress wanted to act, they could do so, but in the meantime, there should be an ability for competitors to buy programming from other operators so that consumers have more choice and consumers have um, the access to competition. And we heard the same arguments during that debate, that there was plenty of competition, there was no need for rules, there were lots of players in the market, but the Commission still ended up deciding that allowing for competitors to buy programming from their competitors was a good thing for consumers and for competition. So I think that was that's an example of how the Commission can continue to interpret the statute through changing technologies in ways that encourage competition and encourage consumer choice. Um, and then, you know, a lot of folks here have mentioned uh, the role for the FTC and maybe that this should be in the jurisdiction of the FTC. And I can tell you, for, for someone who represents consumers at Consumers Union, um, we have millions of subscribers that we try to ensure are protected and are the beneficiaries of good policies. And my concern with an FTC approach, I have many concerns, but one concern would be that it's my understanding that consumers and consumer organizations are not able to appeal FTC decisions. And this is an area that we feel strongly about representing consumers to be able to appeal decisions that the, that the FTC would make. Um, and I would also add that, you know, an FTC approach, I think, would limit the FCC's approach, which we think has greater jurisdiction, and we, we agree with that jurisdiction. And um, I don't know what Commissioner McDowell would do if there was less of a role for FCC. I would miss his um, <laughs> speeches on many of these issues if the FTC was, uh, was more in control of these issues. But overall, I agree that if there's a stomach for rewriting the Telecom Act, then Congress should do so. But I still think that the FCC can continue to interpret the statute, is able to interpret the statute to ensure that there are fair rules of the road in all markets for all stakeholders. Okay. That uh, brings us to the point in the program where you will have the chance to approach the mics and ask questions or comments. However, before you do so, I'm going to ask if any of the panelists or either of the speakers have anything further to add after listening to each other 
So if you wish to make a comment or a question, you, you see where the microphones are, you can head for them. I honestly can't see them very well. I would like to identify who you are. It is really bright. <laughs> identify who you are and why you're here. Anybody have anything else they need to say before we start with the audience participation? All right, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. I, I couldn't resist asking questions. Uh, Identify who you are. My, my name is Mike Hurst. I'm an AUSA. Y'all are probably wondering why I'm asking a telecom question as a criminal federal prosecutor, but I used to do these issues. Um, can I ask a question to the audience first? Who in here has a landline phone still? All right, about 15 of y'all. Okay, the first question I want to ask the panelists, uh, a hypothetical, since we're talking about rewriting the Telecom Act, what would a world look like if Congress were to completely deregulate Title I service, telecom services? That's the first question. What would a world look like if they were just to deregulate telecom services, like information services? The second question is, particularly related to, to Maureen, is do you, since your FTC background, antitrust background, do you see the provision of wireless broadband, satellite broadband, cable broadband, and Fios broadband as competitive services in, in the sense that they provide different levels of broadband, uh, different speeds of broadband. Do you see those as competitive such that the, if, if the marketplace, and I'm from Mississippi, so we probably have one place that has all four of those, but if, do you see a, a marketplace that has all four of those as being a competitive marketplace or, or not based upon the different levels of speed? So, I guess just to clarify your question though, are you asking us what would the world look like if uh, Congress were to deregulate information services under Title I or telecom services under no, Title II? No, 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 no. So you're not asking just about the information services, about te te telecom services. So basically getting rid of Title II? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose in that context you'd probably have a congressional determination that competition was sufficient uh, to warrant a um, more of an adju adjudicatory regime where you had more of, as Maureen said, an FTC type model of, um, you know, just assessing sort of is there consumer harm uh, after the fact rather than having sort of a proactive, prescriptive, um, here are the rules of the road that you must follow to enter this space. Yeah, and then and then it will go into question everything from uh, interconnection obligations to uh, contribution to universal service, all of that. So I, I, you know, I don't see Congress doing that anytime in the future. That's Maureen, you want to hit both barrels while you're ready? Sure. So, so on the first one, my inclination would be to say it'll look like every other market. I mean, that look there like what? other markets. You know, there's lots of markets in the U.S. that are, you know, very interconnected. Payment systems, you know, uh, petroleum distribution. Not all of them have all these, you know, prescriptive requirements. So I, I'm not saying that there's no role, you know, for, for a regulator. Uh, in uh, the communications market, but it's really important to look at, at how other markets already work under a less regulatory system. And then your question about competition, and certainly a big factor in antitrust analysis is figuring out what products are in the same market. What so you look at whether, for the marginal consumer, would a change in price, a significant sustained uh, change in price, cause that of one product cause a consumer to switch to another product. So for a lot of consumers, you know, you, you still have consumers who are using, di happily using dial-up, right? They say, all, all I really want is email, and so I don't, I don't need really fast speed. So you, you'd really have to take a picture of a, of a market and get a good idea of what the consumer uses are, what they foresee uses being, rather than sort of saying, well, if everybody doesn't have, you know, the fastest, broadband in the world, it means it's not a competitive market. You really have to look at what do consumers want it for, what are they willing to pay for it, and what are their options, uh, you know, if the price for, you know, the, the fastest is too high. So, so I think, you know, you have to look more broadly. Um, so I, you know, I'd agree with Sean that I think it would cause a lot of complications, especially when it comes to USF, um, and more importantly, 
for or my organization, our subscribers and consumers, just basic consumer protections. What do telephone bills look like? How much transparency is 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 needed on telephone bills? And so I think for us, just the removal of any basic the ability to have any basic consumer protections would cause great problems. Well, if I could just respond, I mean, I, I do think that there's a difference between sort of economic regulation and more sort of social public safety type regulation. So, I mean, you know, if Congress did remove economic regulation, the, you know, 201, 202 type regulation, I don't know that that would necessarily mean that that would be an end to universal service obligations. It obviously have to be addressed explicitly in the legislation, but, um, you know, I could certainly see a wor world where you would still have um, you know, social public safety related obligations, um, even in the absence of economic regulations. That, sorry, just quickly. I mean, that that might be true, but I think the question was what, what would happen if you got rid of Title Two, and that Title Two involves USF and consumer protections. And so, if there's subsets that are that remain, that would be great. But an entire removal of Title Two would, I think, cause problems on those issues. Michael J, you're dying. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm dying, but uh, I, first of all, I was going to make the point that uh, if we're eliminating economic regulation, the world would work, would work a lot better. Uh, just think about it. In the Internet space, you don't have all this economic regulation governing the exchange of traffic and other factors, uh, pricing, anything like that. Uh, and, you know, it's all working really well, and it's worked for a couple of decades really well. Uh, so I don't think that if you eliminated economic regulation that there would be any downside. In fact, things would start to happen so that the structures that are in place and the, uh, are in sync with the economic realities of life. And companies would have to change the way in which they do business in order to reflect what really is the value of the products and services they offer in today's, given today's technology in today's market. And you would see more rapid change in technology in the delivery of some communication services by getting rid of this structure that holds in place the old world. So I think you would improve the marketplace. Now I would agree with the comments that you still have antitrust laws in place to deal with competition issues. You still have some basic consumer protections in place so that you don't have fraud and improper billing and other things. And you also would need something, as I alluded to earlier, I believe to ensure that the infrastructure is available in all parts of the country. Commissioner, do you feel uh, okay. Next question. <laughs> Good morning, Hans Haney. Uh, so I, I didn't hear anyone allege that the world is going to come to an end if Title II were eliminated. My question is a follow-up. Does anyone believe that the Federal Trade Commission, pursuant to the FTC Act, does not have jurisdiction to combat uh, deceptive business practices or unfair competition in the broadband market? Um, I'll take the first whack at that. Um, if broadband gets reclassified, it may lose that jurisdiction because the FTC is a common carrier exemption. It interprets that exemption fairly narrowly to say it's a common carrier, acting as a common carrier, um, and in the uh, broadband connectivity competition report that the FTC staff issued in 2007, we did talk about that, uh, that because broadband had not been deemed um, a common carrier service. So I think that, you know, that, that's another issue to think about in the whole debate about net neutrality is if you're trying to give, you know, more protections to certain things, you might also be losing the ability of the FTC to, to reach some things that it can reach now. Anyone else? I mean, I would just comment, I'm not an antitrust expert, so I'll give that um, up front, but I think one of the concerns that we would have is that my understanding is that under, uh, I think, Section 5 of the Unfair Trade Practices Act, there is no ability for consumers to bring a private right, private cause of action. And so, you know, these days, anyone can be an innovator, an entrepreneur. Someone like me, which is unlikely, could be an innovator, an entrepreneur. And if I create a service or an application that might compete with, you know, a Verizon application or AT&T application, and there was an unfair practice or degradation, what whatever the case may be, I'm not sure it's clear that I would have the financial ability to bring a private right, private cause of action against a company. And so I, I think that that is an additional concern of there being no FCC um, role in, in these issues. Um, 
So under the FTC Act, it's true that there's not a private right of action, but under the Sherman Act, under the, any, uh, the other antitrust laws, there, there can be. Now, right. who, whether you can afford to and sue them is another, that, is another that was, question. That was the issue that I was going to raise. Th that's a, another role that um, government enforcement plays. Okay. Anybody on this side? If not, then... Uh, thank you. Uh, John Borperian, uh, White Plains, New York, the birthplace of New York State. Uh, the declaration was first, a declaration was first read there. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, also a member of the White Plains uh, Cable Television Commission, and I just wish to pose a question to you with your expertise as to the state of a patient, the patient being um, community access television in this, uh, at this time. Um, I've noticed uh, back in the early 90s, the PEG channels, public access, education access, and government access, it was very clear, the, the delineation that it was strictly the electric mirror cable television in which the community received that information. Uh, White Plains is over 50,000 people, it's 90, over 95% uh, of the households are wired, and um, we have two uh, providers, that being Cablevision and uh, Verizon. Congressman, uh, I've got five. Uh, <laughs> I was just curious, with a rewrite of the Telecom Act, uh, what, if any, um, protection may there be with uh, community access television? And actually, it's a twofold question. Just could you give me an idea of uh, what you <laughs> foresee as the state of community access at this point in time? And uh, like I said, if there is a rewrite, what, if any, effect would that have on community access television? Well, I, I'd offer a, a, a little larger observation. The whole cable model, in my view, is collapsing. Uh, the notion of having a, an aggregator of cable channels that is going to uh, deliver services in the way we have been doing it over the last uh, couple of decades, well, I guess last 50 years, I, I think is going away. Uh, the economics aren't working anymore. Uh, the economics aren't working for a variety of reasons, but one major reason is, is because the advertising revenue used to support content and infrastructure. So whether it was in broadcasting or through cable mechanisms or others, the advertising revenue went to support the development of content and, the, uh, and infrastructure. Today, the advertising revenue is going to search engines and other players and is not going to the content providers and the infrastructure providers. So the content providers are looking around and saying, where do we get revenue? And they are deciding to try to get it from the infrastructure developers or providers uh, because that's who is carrying their content. So the infrastructure developers are raising the prices uh, to consumers, the end user, because the pr price of programming is going up. This model isn't sustainable because people can go online now and they can get a lot of content. So the whole model is going, is going to be replaced. What that model is, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to include a structure such as we've had for Cablevision with mandated local PEG channels, public educational and governmental channels. So we can enjoy it while it's here, but that ain't sustainable going forward in my judgment. And so I think that, I, and I doubt that Congress is going to be able to figure out a way to legislate it to make it work in a new world of online delivery of video services. Uh, um, I was just going to add that um, I, I agree with Tom that the model is changing and at certain points not going to be sustainable. But I think the question is, do you see the social value of having the type of peg services channels that currently are in existence are, are, and are slowly dying? And um, I would argue that there are um, social civic benefits to having those PAC channels. And, um, and certainly, you know, when I was growing up in my high school, I think there were classes structured around training kids how to operate cameras that eventually allowed them to put programs on television that allows them the opportunity to really engage in broadcasting um, or um, other types of uh, community reporting that um, I think are very beneficial. Um, I think there's, if, if Congress does take up um, uh, a rewrite, I think there's a very easy small fix on allowing uh, uh, 
franchise fees to go into not just supporting capital expenses, but also uh, other type of expenses like hiring and uh, paying salaries and stuff like that, which I don't think was intent of the drafters at the time was putting statute to have that very narrow limitation. So, but how far that's going to go in terms of sustaining pay, uh, that's, that's a question that I think Tom's correct on that. I would just add, okay, I would Please. just add one, one other issue that um, this would fall under. I think Sean is absolutely right. And I think the other thing we'd have to think about is, you know, will there be a national franchising law or will, there, will it still be state franchising? And if it's still state franchising, that's something states can decide individually if they want peg channel. So I think that'll be another issue. Is, is, is this going to be a, a more of a national franchising issue or a state franchising issue? Well, I mean, as, as Tom mentioned, I think Sean agreed with, the current cable model is, is evolving. And I think one particular way where it's evolving is this whole notion of linear programming, which is really what the 84 Act was based on, was, you know, here, you know here's the model, you're going to have linear programming, and, you know, peg rights are sort of hooked to, uh, you know, certain expectations about being in linear programming, where channel placement on linear programming, and, you know, I think to the extent that Congress um, were to reevaluate those rules, uh, you know, to the extent that there are going to be PEG programming obligations, um, you know, I would think that they would probably be ripe for, um, uh, you know, sort of more of the on-demand space than, than linear programming. While people, as Sean mentioned, for the various sort of social, civic reasons, may want to still have access to PEG programming, I, I don't think you necessarily need to have them uh, on a linear channel and certain channel placement, I, you know, I, I would expect there to be a debate about whether that needs to continue to occur as long as they're accessible through an on-demand library. I'm not sure what the point was with the question a while ago about how many of us still had landline. I've been thinking ever since then that I remember when not only was that the only thing there was, but they didn't even have dials on the front of them. <laughs> I offer that only to uh, well, I mean, how old I've gotten, I guess, but also <laughs> to observe just what a small slice of communications history we're talking about when we talk about the era of the broadband that we are now in, and to say whatever we are saying about the regulation of the future of where this is going, it's going to be very hard to predict where the technology is going. The technology is changing so much and so rapidly now that it's an exciting time and place to be in this field. Excuse my interruption. Uh, Howard Lim, New York State Conservative Party. Uh, many, if not most, of the members of Congress closely associated with net neutrality were defeated uh, and will not be returning to Congress in the next session. I was wondering if each of the mem members of the panel would uh, comment on what they consider, uh, what they think, the uh, will of the new Congress, particularly in the House, will be in regard to net neutrality and uh, regulation of the internet and the direction they see uh, the Congress going in in the future. Who wants to back that one? I guess I will. Okay. Well, as I think Rob alluded to earlier, you had a majority of the members of the 111th Congress come out in opposition to the reclassification of broadband services and you can, you know, parse whether there may be debate whether, you know, for, for the 300 plus, how much of that was regulation of broadband services under Title II versus how much of that was just flat out opposition to the imposition of broad, broadband network management regulations. But I think certainly, I mean, you saw every House Republican sign a letter in opposition to what the FCC was doing. and. So I think it's pretty clear when you look at the, the Republican leadership of the House and the 112th Congress that um, there will be a pretty strong opposition to the FCC moving forward with net neutrality rules under Title I or Title II. And I think that the, the recent press reports of after the signals from the chairman's office about what he might be contemplating in terms of the December meeting on net neutrality and the immediate uh, and rather hostile response from House Republicans about his doing that is a pretty good indication for what is likely to come, at least from the House Republicans um, that are returning to Congress. And I mean, I, I would expect 
um, at least a lot of the incoming um, Republicans to share those same views because this is a class um, that is very suspicious of government involvement in the free market. Um, I, I'm going to sidestep the question exactly. So, um, but I, I think um, it is interesting, and that's why I have a somewhat more pessimistic view of you know whether or not uh, Congress is going to undertake a rewrite of the Communications Act, which is that uh, uh, going back to again the experience of the the Waxman legislation, when you have some of the major players in the industry, whether it's on the provider side or the the edge tech companies and consumer groups, including uh, Peru's own. Uh, uh, consumer, uh, consumer Union, all coalescing around a set of principles, legislative uh, principles that would put a lot of uncertainty behind us, uh, and yet we were not able to gather the, the sort of bipartisan support that we thought uh, would be forthcoming. Um, I, I don't know what else what more we can do if the industry is asking for it, if the consumers are asking for it, if if everyone's asking for it and and still there was no action. So I, I so uh, let me just leave it there. Anyone else? Uh, rebuttal? Uh, seeing none, is there another question from the body? I'm Brian Tremont with Wilkinson Barker. A lot of the policy debate these days is focused on job creation and innovation, fostering innovative technologies. When you think about a rewrite of the Act, where are the places where a rewrite could foster those twin goals of job creation, economic growth, and additional innovation in the space? Spectrum. I mean, that's the most sort of obvious choices we face um, the need of uh, legislatively paving the way for incentive auction. I think that's a, that's a place in which uh, Congress must focus on that. Um, that said, I also think there are ways of uh, creating paths for more spectrum without opening other titles of the act. And I, I think that's, uh, that's going to be a debate going forward. So. Tom, I saw you <coughs> indicating that. Is there yeah. I mentioned some things earlier in my comments, but I, I'd start this way. The, uh, the bottom line today is, is that there is a, a substantial uncertainty about regulation from both the federal, or from the federal level, the state level, and the local level of the infrastructure, of the services that are offered, the way you bill for the services, the taxation. I mean, you, we get taxation. Just think about this. You have taxation of townships, school districts, uh, local communities, counties, states, and it's different for everyone. So, so you have, for a company like ours, just the billing processes to deal with the taxation is staggering, okay? Then you have all these state requirements for what you should put on the bill and how you present the bill. So that varies from, from area to area. Just the billing process and the regulation of the billing process and the role of government in, in that process is costly, exceedingly costly, and that cost is borne by consumers. That, de or that de uh, limits, then, uh, the ability to invest in other things and to grow the business in the way you should. So that's just one small area. But all of these other things we've been talking about, the way the universal service system is structured, the way the intercarrier compensation system is structured, all of those things have economic impact uh, on the industry. Then you have the concerns about what will happen with new innovation. So right now, we announced this past week, we want to make the cell phone your, your credit card. Okay. So then you think about all the rules. You know, who, what will the FCC do with that? How are they going to look at that? Uh, how will the SEC look at it? I mean, the, the rules are staggering. I just say that as a player in the industry now, as you try to take this industry that is bound by the T Communications Act and this unique agency, the FCC, and these state public service commissions, and you try to make that into a totally different industry, that the role of government and the regulations of government really hamstring your ability to do it, and they delay progress, and they make progress much more costly. 
So I'd say it's jobs, it's productivity, it's economic growth that would be unleashed if you could somehow untangle the mess that governs the industry today. Any other comments? If not, then once again, is anyone from the floor who uh, wishes to ask or comment? Norman, I just permit asking, but since uh, things are a little slow, we'll allow comments. Seeing none, we're actually going to get through ahead of time. So at 12:30, we have the luncheon with the accompanying debate in the uh, books in the grand ballroom. If I'm wrong, look on your program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks.